To show how to conduct a gauge repeatability and reproducibility study, we're going to walk through the steps of conducting a gauge r, &R using a digital caliper. For this example, we're going to use 10 volts. Depending on how you set up your gauge r, &R this is typically conducted with three operators and 10 parts. As you collect your 10 parts, it's very important to make sure that your 10 parts span the entire specification limits and you actually have defective parts so that you can make sure that you have enough resolution within your gauge to detect good parts and bad parts. Once we have our 10 parts, it's important to make sure that we number our parts so that we can understand the order and keep track of that. And so for these parts, since I have 10 parts, we're just going to number those 1 through 10. As we set up our gauge r, &R we typically use a format such as this. And there's different ways to walk through and, and do a gauge r, &R. In this example, we're going to go through and use 10 different parts and three different operators. And each operator will conduct two trials each. This gives us information about the repeatability and also the reproducibility between the three operators. So each organization is a little bit different with what information that they include in the header of their gauge r, &R. In this one, we've included the name of the gauge, which is a digital caliper, the gauge number, if we're using a generic digital cal caliper for this example, it typically has a five-digit number, dash, and then three different numbers after that. And the beginning five numbers represent the type of gauge that it is, and the last digits after the hyphen provide information on which number that is of that type of that gauge, and then the date that the gauge r, &R was conducted. It's important when we go through and we start actually measuring the parts for a gauge r, &R study to think about the order that we're going to, to measure the parts. If we go through and we measure the parts in order, we potentially bias our results. So it's important to go through and randomize our results. As we go through and we use a gauge, that learning curve increases. And so we want to avoid any bias. In addition, it's also important as we run this, we have three different operators, and those three operators are not the individual that's recording the data. For example, if we go through and we measure part one, and we measure part one again, as the operator, you know what your reading is, and it might be a little bit of human nature that you go through and you try and make sure you get the same reading again. And we want to avoid that. We want people to actually get the reading without any bias from the learning curve or, or knowing what the, what the previous reading was. And so we're going to go through and we're going to randomize each of these trials with each operator so that we can take any potential bias and we're randomizing it throughout the entire study. So one way to make sure that we're randomizing our readings is to use a random number generator. And there's considerable number of apps out there, or you can do something simple like writing down numbers 1 through 10 and pulling those out of a hat. With a random number generator, we just want to go through and figure out what part we should measure next. And so we're taking that bias throughout our entire gauge r, &R study to make sure that we're not influencing our results. So with our random number generator, we would look to see what part we should be measuring. In this case, we're going to be measuring part number four next. With our digital caliper, we would make sure that the gauge is zeroed out, and then we would measure our part. And in this case, the reading is 1.098. And we would take that reading then, and since this would be for operator 1 and part number 4, we would put that reading in there, which was 1.098. Next step would be to use our random number generator again to see which part we should use. And in this case, it's 5. So we'd find part number 5 then. We would zero out our gauge again, and then measure part number 5. And in this case, we have a reading of 
1.094. And for operator 1 with part 5, then, we would enter in 1.094. At this point, operator 1 would have completed trial 1. We would go through and we would randomize the first trial. The next step would be for operator 1 to repeat the en entire measurement of all 10 parts for trial 2, still using the same methods for randomization. And then once operator 1 is done with both trial 1 and trial 2, we would go through the same steps for operator 2 and operator 3. Operator 2 next would go through and we would randomize all 10 parts for trial 1. Then we would randomize all 10 parts for trial 2. And then for operator 3, we would randomize all 10 parts for trial 1 and all 10 parts for trial 2. Now it's important to note that even though for this video I took the parts and did the readings for trial 1, these three operators would be different people than the person that's recording the data. So in total for this process, to conduct it, I would really need four people. The three operators that are, that are performing the gauge r and &R, and the one person that's recording the data as the gauge r and &R is being conducted. Okay. So it's all really in the feel of the gauge and who that user is, which is why we're taking into account the reproducibility, which are the different readings between the three operators in this example. At this point, we've completed all of the gauging for all three operators and both trials. And so this template now shows all of the collected information. In a subsequent video, I'm going to show how you take this information and then analyze it using statistical software such as Minitab.